Turning your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're continuing, of course, our study of Paul's letter. It's his last letter. He's writing it to his friend, Timothy, his kindred spirit, his fellow worker, his son in the faith. Paul's in prison in Rome. He's about to be put to death, put to death for his faith. You know, he's a Roman citizen, so they can't crucify him like they did some of the others. The best we understand is they probably cut his head off. He is writing to Timothy, and he's saying, Timothy, come as quickly as you can, but he's giving Timothy some information. His plan, of course, is to encourage Timothy. His plan is to instruct Timothy, and his plan is to call... to tell Timothy to come as quickly as possible. It's a very practical letter. I mean, there's truths in here. There, there, there's some deep truths. This is a, a book in which you really get into it and you see things that we can apply in our lives right now. The truths in this letter are powerful. They'll help us as we stand for Jesus Christ in a fallen world. We're in that last section, uh, of our, or the last this section of chapter 2 deals with making disciples, taking what you've been taught. As Paul said, Timothy, take what I've taught you, turn around and teach that to other people as well. We saw last time that he got specific. He said, be like a soldier and have your priorities to please Jesus Christ. He said, be like the athlete and obey the rules, live by the scripture. Be like the hardworking farmer who expects the rewards. In other words, he says, Timothy, be faithful in the ministry. And that's the charge to every one of us. Because when we stand before our Savior Jesus Christ, we want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. So this morning, we continue. We're going to see truths about Jesus and about the gospel and about the word of God and about Paul's ministry. And the goal is that we'd be encouraged as we study through all of this. Now, I want you to think about it. As those, those of us who know Jesus Christ as Savior, we have a message. We call that message the gospel, and the word gospel means good news. We have a message that is good news for every person. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, 16, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. It's the power of God that results in salvation. This gospel message is the message that brings salvation to everyone who believes. We have a great message. In chapter 1, verse 8, Paul said, suffer for the gospel. And in chapter 1, verse 10, he said, Jesus Christ, through his gospel, has abolished death and brought life. What exactly is the gospel? Well, we said it hundreds of times here. It is that Jesus died on the cross to pay for sin and rose again to conquer death. And whoever believes in him will never perish but have everlasting life. The gospel is the death and resurrection of Christ. As we look at this little section this morning, we're going to see a number of things. First of all, we're going to see about Jesus Christ. We're going to see that he's the God-man. He's going to talk about his deity and his humanity in this passage. Then we're going to see the gospel dealing with his death and resurrection. Then we're going to talk about the word of God, and it is so powerful. The word of God cannot be stopped. It doesn't matter. Present the scripture. Present the Bible. Know the word. Always give the word. It can never be stopped. And then last but not least, we're going to see Paul's ministry. He says, my whole idea is that people would come to know Jesus Christ, that they would have salvation, which is through Jesus Christ. Let me break down the passage for you. We're just looking at verses 8, 9, and 10 this morning. Uh, verse 8, he, going to, he says, remember Christ. And he talks about his deity through his resurrection. He talks about his humanity being a descendant of King David. Then he says, remember the word of God. It's never bound. It cannot be stopped. And then he talks about his own ministry, and it's the idea of salvation, and he talks about the eternal glory that comes with salvation. So this passage is, is really powerful. There's a lot in there. Even though we're looking at just three verses, we'll, we'll see that. Let me review, give you a quick review. Remember verse 2? Look at verse 2 again of chapter 2. He says, Timothy, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. In other words, the things you've heard me teach, Timothy, in front of other people, you entrust these to faithful people, faithful men who will be able to teach others as well. The whole idea is to make disciples. Take what we've been taught and teach others. That's our goal of our church. It goes back to Matthew 28 where Jesus came out and spoke saying all the authority has been given to me in heaven and earth go you therefore and make disciples making disciples is evangelizing and training leading people to Christ and then training them equipping them taking what you've been taught and entrusting it to other people that is the goal of our local church and the goal of what we're supposed to do individually and as a body he gave three illustrations I mentioned it a while ago he said be like a soldier and have the right priorities to please Jesus Christ be like the athlete that's disciplined and obedience which means live by the scripture and then be like the farmer Farmer expecting to gain the rewards, and that's what we expect when we live righteously and godly in a present age. So there's some great things there. As we look this morning, he's going to talk about Jesus. 
and the Word of God and salvation. There's a lot there. This is an incredible letter. It's not a very long letter when you think about it. There's only four chapters, and yet there is so much there. That's one of the reasons I wanted to study 2 Timothy this fall, because it is a great discipleship book. It's, it's all the way through. Now, he, he gives all kind of truths, and he talks about the gospel. He talks about uh, all kind of different things. He talks about the end times. He talks about, in chapter 3, about in the last days, difficult times will come, and he talks about all these things. This morning, three things. He's going to talk about Jesus. He's He's going to talk about the whole idea of the Word of God, and he's going to talk about the whole idea of salvation. He starts, starts with, let's say, let's remember Jesus. And he's going to do two things. He's going to talk about Jesus' deity, which means Jesus is God, and then he's going to talk about his humanity, which means Jesus is a man. Understand that Jesus Christ is called the God-man. He's the only creature, only one that's ever been. There's God, and then there's people, and then there's Jesus, who is God who became a man, the God-man. Jesus Christ. Notice what he says in verse 8. He says, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel. He says, remember Jesus. And by the way, in the Greek, it actually says, keep on remembering Jesus. The idea there is keep on focusing on Jesus. The whole focus of the Christian life is Jesus. We run the race of the Christian life, run the race with endurance, looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Everything for us centers around Jesus. He is the way of salvation, the person of Christ. He is the power. We can do all things through the one who strengthens us. He is the one that we're looking for, the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Everything centers around Jesus, and so we should be focusing on him. All of what we believe goes back to Jesus. In fact, the whole story of the Bible, remember, as the perfect God brings sinful man back to himself, how? Through his son, Jesus Christ. Christ. That's how it all works. Jesus Christ came and died on the cross to pay for our sins, and that's the plan. The whole Old Testament looks forward to Jesus. The New Testament looks back to Jesus. And so he says, remember Jesus Christ. Keep the focus on Christ. That's one of the things that I'm so excited about how our church, our focus in this church is on our Savior, Jesus Christ. We come together on a Sunday morning to worship our Savior, Jesus Christ, and be trained and equipped to serve him. The focus of this body is Jesus Christ. Christ our Savior. We say it all the time. When you walk out this door, you don't represent Stillwater Bible Church. You can tell people, come to our church. You represent Jesus Christ. He is your Savior. You're called a Christian. You're a follower of Jesus Christ. So he says, just remember Jesus Christ. Keep the focus on him. He's both God and man. And what he's going to do is he's going to talk about death and resurrection, conquering death. That's his deity. Then he's going to say he's a descendant of David, the king, king of kings, lord of lords. That's his humanity. Look at verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, what? Risen from the dead. That's his deity. Descendant of David. That's his humanity, and we're going to see it. Let's think about this. And by the way, the same truth is found in Romans. Let me show you something. If you've never seen this before, in Romans chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh. That's his humanity. And then it says, He was declared to be the Son of God by his resurrection of the dead, according to the Spirit of the holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. That's his deity. So even in Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, it talks about his humanity and his deity and Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, it talks about his deity and his humanity. Let's talk about his deity. And he's dealing it with the resurrection. And he talked about his death and resurrection, how he conquered death. That's his deity. Remember, he says, remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. By the way, this is the message. Anybody could go to the cross and say, I'm dying for the sins of the world. Any of you could say it. You could say, because see, thousands of people were crucified. Jesus Christ is the one who died on the cross to pay for our sins, was buried, and rose again on the third day. What proved that he is the Son of God, what proved that he is deity, is his resurrection. He died and rose again. He conquered death. That's his deity. And this is so powerful. Never forget this. So he says, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. And you think back to the whole story of how Jesus told his men five different times in the Gospel of Matthew. He tells them, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'll be handed over to the religious leaders. I'll be crucified. Three days later, I will rise again. And they missed it all. And when Jesus died on the cross, they walked away. They were all sad. They were saying things like, we thought he was the Messiah. Three days later, he rises from the grave. That proved that he indeed is the Son of God. That's his deity. So he says, remember Jesus, risen from the dead. See, Jesus died to pay for sin. 1 John 2, 2, he's the satisfactory payment. Not for our sins only, but for the sins of the entire world. Jesus Christ rose to conquer death. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55. Oh, death, where is your sting? There's not one. 
the resurrection proves he indeed is the Son of God. So remember Jesus Christ. When you think about your Savior, realize that he is the eternal God who left the glories of heaven to become a human being, to die for us, pay for sin, and rise again, showing that he is God. But there's more. There's the fact that he's a human being. He's a descendant of David. Notice what it says. Remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead, descendant of David. That's humanity. See, there was a promise to King David. And, and here's the great truth, that at a point in time in history, Jesus Christ, who is the eternal God, the eternal Son of God at a point in time in history, left the glories of heaven to become a human person, human being. Galatians 4, 4, in the fullness of time, God brought forth his Son, born of a woman. Jesus Christ became a human being. There was a promise way back in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 17, that David's son, that he would have a son who would be the Messiah, the Savior, and the King. King David was told one of his descendants would sit on the throne of Israel forever and be the Messiah and the King. When this Bible says... Jesus Christ risen from the dead, a descendant of David. That's showing that he became that human being who could rule the world. You remember at his birth, Luke chapter 1 verse 32, the angel tells Mary, he shall be great and be called what? The son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He is a descendant of King David. So think about Jesus. Remember who he is. He is God from his resurrection. He is man as the son of David. When we think about Jesus, he's the God-man. And there's a reason he's the God-man. He's God so he could pay for sin, die and rise again and pay for sin. He is man so he could die for our sin. He is the mediator between God and men. There's only one mediator. In fact, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1-6 through 6 says there's only one mediator between God and men. It is the man, Christ Jesus. He became a human being. The perfect God became a human being, the God-man, so he could die in our place, pay for our sin, rise again, conquer death, and give us life. That's who he is. So notice he says, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, he's God, descendant of David, he's a man. And then he says this, according to my gospel. That's my good news message. Paul had a good news message. It's the same message as ours. We call the gospel. The gospel is the good news. The good news is this. Jesus came to the earth, died on the cross to pay for sin, rose from the grave to conquer death. That's the good news message. That's our message. People get confused and they say, what are you going to tell people? What do you tell people? You tell them that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who came to the earth, died on the cross to pay for sin, and rose from the grave to conquer death. That's the good news message. You have a Savior. You have the one who died and rose again. The response is to believe in Jesus Christ for eternal life. The response is to put your faith in Christ for eternal life. And so Paul starts off and he says, let's do this, Timothy. Remember, keep on remembering Jesus. He's the son of God. He was raised from the dead. He is a descendant of David. He's that perfect man. And this is according to the gospel, the death and the resurrection of Christ. From there, as we go to verse 9, he talks a little bit about himself, but he talks about the Word of God. And he says, remember God's Word. It can never be stopped. It can never be bound. Look what he says. According to my gospel, for which, verse 9, for which I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal. He says, I'm in prison because of my message. He says, but guess what? The Word of God is not imprisoned. You can't stop the Bible. You can't stop the Bible. Paul says, you know, as I got out there and I spread my message and I talked to people about Jesus and I said he's the God man and he died on the cross and paid for sin and he rose again and he gives eternal life and whoever believes in him will never perish and all your sons of God by faith in Christ. Over and over, Paul said it countless times. We know it's over a it's over hundred and something times in the New Testament that you're saved by faith in Christ. He got put into prison. He says, I suffer hardship. I'm even in prison because of my stand for Christ. And we know that Paul will never get out of prison. This last time when he writes 2 Timothy, he is put to death shortly after this letter is written. We don't know if Timothy ever made it there or not before Paul died. So Paul says, even though I, I, I'm standing for Christ, they put me in prison, but, and here's what's good, the Word of God is not in prison. They can't stop the Bible. The Word of God can never be stopped. Let me tell you something. You know the Bible. Always present the truths of the Scripture. It can never be stopped. When you present the truths of the Bible, you don't have to be smart, you don't have to be clever, you don't have to know all these things, you just need to know the truth. And the truth will set people what? Free. 
You know the truth. The Word of God, and literally, by the way, I want to show you something. This, the, my Bible reads it this way, but the Word of God is not imprisoned. Literally in the Greek, it says, it has not been imprisoned. It means not been imprisoned and never will be. It cannot be stopped. Nothing can stop the Word of God. Think about this. It's alive. It's powerful. It's effective. It's never void. It's the truth. It never comes back void. It always does exactly what God wants it to do. Nothing can stop the Word of God. When you're sharing your faith, when you're talking to people, give them the truths of the Scripture. To Give them John 3, 16. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, whosoever believe in Him, not perish, but have eternal life. Listen, nothing can stop that. The Holy Spirit's going to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Sin because they have not believed. The Word of God is powerful. That's why I don't do speeches. I don't do sermons. That, that's no, there's no power in that. The power is in the Bible. The power is the Word of God. The power is what it says. Remember Jesus risen from the dead. And remember he's a descendant of David. Remember that the Word of God cannot be stopped. How do you view the Bible? Do you view it as inspired by God? 2 Timothy 3.16. Do you realize that it's from God to man? 2 Timothy 3.16 also. And do you realize that it's from God through man? 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 20 and 21. You have... The authority, the written word of God, alive, powerful, sharpening to its sword, pierces for his division of soul and spirit, never comes back void, profitable in his truth. You have that in your hands. You know it, you proclaim it, the word of God cannot be stopped. Paul said they can put me in prison all they want to, but they cannot stop the truths of the Bible. There was one other thing that he says, and that's verse 10. And he says, remember his ministry. And look what he says. For this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen so that, here's what I do, I, I, so that what? So that they may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. Paul says, why do I suffer? Why do I get in prison? Why do I, stay? Why do I endure all things? Why? So that people can come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. He says for the chosen, sometimes the word chosen or elect is used to describe those who have trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. He says, listen, I do this so that people can know Christ as Savior. Uh, the, the whole bottom line is that people, God's plan is that whoever believes in Christ, he gives to them eternal life. Notice what he says, so that Last half of the verse, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. Now, I think in this flow of this passage, the salvation he's talking about is what we call justification salvation. We'd say eternal life salvation. But the truth is through Jesus Christ is all salvation, whether it's justification salvation or Christian life salvation or even future salvation. That's all through Jesus Christ. Paul says the whole reason I exist Paul says that I want people to obtain salvation. When we walk out these doors and you talk to people, what do you want? Do you want them to know Jesus Christ as Savior? Do you want them to put their faith in Christ for eternal life? That's why we're here. Why did he leave us on this earth? Paul says, that, that here's what he says about his life. He says, he lives so that others will come to salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. This is his reason to being left on the earth. He says, the whole reason I endure all of these things is so that people could obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus. Why are we left on this earth? Why are we here in this community? Why are your neighbors next to you? Why are the people that you work with next to you? Why are we here? We are here so that those around us can hear the truth of Jesus Christ. And that they might obtain salvation. They might put their faith in Jesus Christ and have salvation. By the way, I love this because notice what it says. It says so that they may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus. Salvation is in Christ. John 14, 6, Jesus, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father except through me. Salvation's in Christ. Acts 4, 12, there is no other name given under, under heaven among men by which we might be saved except the name Jesus. Listen, Jesus is the Savior. People are saved because of Jesus Christ. We're not telling them about to be good and to join a church and to do this. We're telling them to put their trust in Jesus Christ because he is the Savior. He says, I do all of this so that they may have salvation which is in Christ Jesus. Salvation is in the person of Christ. Salvation is in a person. It's not in what we do. Salvation is in the person we trust. Jesus Christ gives us eternal life. Do you think of your life at, at, that you're to go out with the, with the purpose of people coming to know Christ through your life? 
I love what D.L. Moody said. He said, we may be easily too big for God to use, but we're never going to be too small for God to use. The greatest joy in life is to see somebody put their faith in Christ. Paul says, that's why I exist. That's why I do all these things. That's why I go through all this, so that, that they may obtain the salvation which is in Jesus Christ. For the sake of others, may we live in such a way that we take this message into this community. What does Paul say? He says, remember Jesus. He's God. He's man. Remember the word of God. It can't be stopped. Remember while we're here, it is to take this message into this world. When was the last time you told somebody about Jesus Christ? Now think about it. When was the last time you shared your faith? Now, you might say, I, I'm not even sure what to say. If you don't know what to say, take the 412. Brian's teaching this semester. Take the 2-2. I'm doing that next semester, next, next year. We've got, we, come see us. We will get you information. We will train you. We will make sure that you are comfortable sharing your faith. Notice how he ends this little passage. He says, the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it, Eternal glory. Think about the eternal glory. We have eternal life. There is the eternal kingdom, the kingdom and the eternal state. There are eternal rewards. There are eternal glorified bodies. All of that is eternal. All of that comes when you put your faith in Christ, you have eternal life. You have a, you'll have a glorified body. There will be rewards. There is the kingdom. There is the eternal state. All of that tied in. Paul says he serves God and suffers so that others may come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. So what have we seen? Focus on Christ, the God-man. He died and rose again. That's the gospel. Paul's in prison, but the word of God can't be stopped. And Paul's ministry was, was so that others could be saved. So application. Let's keep our focus on Jesus. He's the God-man. He's the mediator. He is God. He rose from the dead. He is man. He is descendant of King David. Never forget who he is. He's the most important one who's ever existed. He is the eternal God who became a man so he could be our mediator. Second, understand the gospel. The gospel is Jesus died and rose again paying for sin. That's the gospel. Jesus died on the cross to pay for sin. Jesus rose from the grave to conquer death. Know what the message is and be ready to share it. And let me just tell you, if you just know that verse right there, John 3, 16, God so loved the world, that's us, that he gave his only begotten son, gave him to die and rise again, that whoever, anyone, would believe in him would never perish but have everlasting life. That's, that's it. Realize the word of God cannot be stopped. It's alive. It's effective. It's profitable. It is the truth. Nothing can stop the Bible. Always give them the Bible because it can't be stopped. And may we live so that others can be saved. May we know the good news message. May we be ready to share the good news message with others. Let's keep our focus on Jesus Christ, the God-man, the one who died and rose again, proclaiming this good news message into our community so others can be saved because nothing can stop you. 